Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. Welcome wherever you are. I'd like to introduce you to the Fiber Channel Industry Association webinar on understanding fiber channel scaling. I hope you're having a good day wherever you are and whatever you're doing, uh, which is actually hopefully paying attention to what we're doing. Uh, my name is Jay Metz. I'm going to be your uh, mostly quiet moderator, fortunately, for this particular session. And we're going to be talking a bit about how Fiber Channel as a technology allows companies and users to, to scale storage solutions uh, from very small sessions, uh, sections like you know, maybe a few, maybe a dozen nodes or something, all the way up to the thousands and tens of thousands of nodes and how it does it um, and the technology behind it. To do this, we've got a couple of experts uh, from a couple of companies that have been doing this for a very long time. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Brandon Hoff from Broadcom, who is a, a software architect and longtime fiber channel guru, and Mark Rogoff, who you may recognize from some of the other uh, technical presentations on storage in the past, including a, a very excellent storage performance benchmarking webinar series that SNEA had put on. So hello, Brandon. Hello, Mark. Hello. Hello. This is Mark. So. Yeah, and um, so I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to welcome the both. I'd like to welcome you, the audience, to this. A uh, little bit of administrative trivia before we get started. I know that they're in, uh, Bright Talk is one of those platforms that we use to do the presentations. And from time to time, there is uh, some variability in, in audio quality. One of the things that we found is that if you happen to be listening through your computer, clearing the cache can sometimes resolve any audio problems or if you've got a lot of different browser windows open that can sometimes cause an issue. So if you do wind up having audio issues, you may want to check your browser cache or the number of uh, <clears throat> processes running in your browser. Uh, we're also going to let you know that we will have uh, the <coughs> excuse me, we will have the presentation available for you for download, and you will be able to peruse this at your own leisure. Uh, we will also be assembling any questions that you have for this particular webinar and putting them into a question and answer blog. So if you've got any questions about scalability or want more details than we're able to go to because of the time allotted, feel free to ask the questions that you have regarding the subject into the question field, and we will get to them as best we can during the session. Or failing that, if we just run out of time, we will put those answers inside of a blog, uh, which will be available at fiberchannel.org after the webinar as soon as we possibly can. I'd also like to point out that if you wouldn't mind, at the end of the webinar, if you could provide feedback, uh, you will have, obviously have a chance for a star rating, of course, but we do thrive on the verbal stuff too. So if there's anything you liked or anything you didn't like, anything that you would like to see next, please include that inside the feedback as we move forward. We want to try to be able to adhere to the needs of our audience, and we read those things very carefully and take a close look at um, how those things actually work. Now, a little bit of the administration uh, trivia is over. Let me give you a little bit of a clue as to how uh, the FCIA works. So this presentation is sponsored by the Fiber Channel Industry Association, which is an organization of fiber channel uh, designers, administrators, manufacturers, integrators, uh, everybody who has some sort of interest in fiber channel, either using it or developing it. Uh, the FCIA represents a large group of people who work to try to provide the best uh, storage networking technology possible. So what we do at the FCIA is we promote the advancement of understanding about fiber channel technologies. And this group, the Education Committee, a part of the FCIA, is responsible for providing vendor neutral and technology neutral sessions to help you, the audience, understand how fiber channel works. So our job is to give you the facts, nothing but the facts, and only the facts about how fiber channel works, what it is best used for, how it actually uh, applies inside of a data center, and to give you the best information that you, uh, you can possibly get uh, from the, best, the most well-known experts inside of the industry. So now that I've blathered on for far too long, I am going to turn it over to Mark, who is going to explain about the particular agenda for fiber channel scaling. Mark, it's up to you. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon. I like to say good morning because it's morning somewhere. This is Mark's voice. You're going to hear another voice. It's going to be Brandon. We would like to keep things 
entertaining for you, and we might actually call to each other during the presentation. The agenda for today's session is right now on the screen. And generally, we would like to show you a couple of things. Number one, we ran a little bit of a survey asking fire channel experts within our respective companies on what different fiber channel capacities they know. We also asked them about whether their customers know details about fiber channel. We will then talk about what makes fiber channel a lossless protocol. Very specifically, it's buffer credits. We'll also talk about topology, show you different types of topologies, most importantly, the ones involving switching. Related with that is ISLs, and ISLs over subscriptions, culminating with a big mesh example of how to put it all together. And then Brandon is going to take you over to specifics on fabric services. How does Fiber Channel find out that there's something new on it? That kind of stuff. We'll touch on zoning, and finally we'll talk about deterministic performance as one of the most important attributes that Fiber Channel brings. So with that, let's move on straight to the survey. The survey, as I said, is, was run in a storage vendor, and we asked them two questions, and that is if we're thinking about a specific typical fabric, just a typical fabric among all the customers that they know, how many ports does that fabric have? And that's the results on the left. And you can see that the, fabric, the typical fabrics kind of vary. We have modest 48 ports. We have 9% of them came back with about 1,000 ports. And then we asked the second question about if they think about a largest fabric implementation they ever know. And we also got a range of answers. And that range is a little greater. It's important to point out a couple of things that 2,000 ports seems to be the biggest one of those in terms of commonality of the largest fabrics. But we'll be remiss if we didn't point out the 10,000 ports core. It was a bit of a surprise to learn that there's so many people and so many customers that think about a fabric that has 10,000 ports or more. So with that, this little survey just points out the flexibility that Fiber Channel brings you. If we talk about the capability of the, of the protocol to be scalable, that scalability is right here. And with that, we'd like to ask a very simple question. How is that scalability maintained in losslessness? Because if there's one thing that Fiber Channel is known for, it's for being lossless. Now I'll pause here and see if we have any questions. Looks like there's none, so we're gonna go straight forward. Next time you guys see this kind of slide, uh, Jay calls it buffer slides, um, make sure that you type in a question if you have any, and we'll pause and answer those. We'd like to keep this a bit more interactive, if possible. So on the question that we asked in the same survey, whether the customers of people that install and deal with Fiber Channel for a living, whether those customers understand what buffer-to-buffer -buffer credits are. It was a bit of a surprise to find out that the impression of the vendor is that 82% of the customers do not know what that is. So with that, we said, okay, Fiber Channel buffer credits are there to enable losslessness, and let's actually go over and show you how that works. You see here a very simple system. We have an initiator, we have a switch in the middle, we have a target. And typically we all understand this. We probably have been with other fiber channel presentations before. And we can have and say, hey, every single connection point, whether that's an HBA or a switch port or a storage array port, is gonna have a certain amount of buffers. Again, to explain what the buffer is, we have other presentations to cover it, but very simply, it's a small memory cell that each HBA or connection port has to keep an IO while it's being processed. And they're temporary. Now, the point here is that we have multiple different buffers at different ends of this connectivity chain. When an initiator has three and target has four and switch has six, there's a multitude. So there must be a mechanism by which everything is being communicated. And that mechanism actually happens during the normal login to the fabric. So when the floggy message is being sent by an initiator, in this case, being plugged in into the switch, 
a part of that flogging message is also telling the switch, hey, I have three buffers. And then an act that comes back from the switch saying, okay, I got your flogging, this is my response, will carry number of buffers that the switch has. The same exact ha happening at the target level. So now at this point of them just simply logging into the fabric, all members of this chain understand how many buffers each one of them has. And they keep account of those buffers. They keep so-called credits, knowing how many buffers does the other one have, and then ultimately how many of those are being used. So here's an example. If we have an initiator that wants to read some data off of the target, the read flag is being sent forward, the request is being sent forward, it's passing through the switch, and the target is gonna receive that, the target is gonna read some of it, and let's say the read produces four IOs. Those four IOs are then sent from the target first to the switch. And the reason it's comfortable to do that is, is because the target knows that there is actually six buffers. So he sends those four IOs, it counts the buffers, and then the switch passes that message forward. However, when the switch gets there, the switch can only send three IOs instead of four because the initiator has three buffers. So what happens at this point? We've sent three IOs down to the initiator. There was four altogether. What happens next? Well, what happens next is very simple, that your initiator starts processing the data that it receives. Let's say it processes two, and at some point is gonna be able to send a so-called already message indicating to the switch and ultimately to the target that it was able to process two IOs out of three. And that's literally the example of losslessness because after that, the switch is gonna send the remaining one IO back to the initiator and the entire line is gonna have an idea to know that, okay, we have sent four IOs, two of them have made safely to the initiator, two others are being processed. I'm there, I'll call and I'll hold on for a second and see if we have any more questions. Actually, yes, we do. Um, regarding your, uh, one of your initial slides that talked about the, the scale of the fabric, one of the, um, one of the progress bars, for lack of a better word, um, had a fabric of 30,000 ports. Can you go a little bit more into detail as to what you mean? Because there's some question as to whether or not 30,000 ports can be supported in a single fabric. Uh, that was actually a good question to ask, and we were thinking about the same thing. The results of the survey is the results of the survey. We didn't limit those. But I think the limitation of the number of ports makes sense, as far as I know. Um, what we're going to do in the Q&A section after this presentation is we're going to research very specifically on the max that we have for common vendors and fill that gap. But a lot of times when I followed up with people, about the question. They said, when we talk about a fabric, we were really thinking about the entire fiber channel controlled universe of ports to specific customer. Within that universe, you probably would have several fabrics and just add, added them all up to say one okay, customer so is covering this many ports. So this could just be very uh, well a, a definitional question or a limit in the survey. Agreed. Okay, that, that works. And, um, and that's all the questions we have at the moment. Awesome. Let's go straight into the topology. We probably know very well this one topology that I'm having on the screen right here. And it's a very simple switched fabric where we have a single switch connecting some hosts and some storage arrays. When we look in here, we can see that a number of hosts are trying to connect to a single port in the storage array. And that brings a concept that we would like you guys to consider and carry out is the so-called fan out. From electro en electric engineering, you might remember that the fan out is something that leaves a transistor. In this case, we have a storage array that might be sending data back to the host. So from the storage array's perspective, fan out in here is four to one. We have four ports from the hosts, single port of the array, there's a four to one. And then if we say the fan out is a little too large, we're not comfortable 
to be sending so many diff- servicing so many different hosts from a single port. We can add a second port, and now in this picture we have a two to one, which is much better than four to one. Naturally, when we talk about fiber channel and old fabrics, we typically see that we have a so-called an odd or even fabric. A lot of times there's best practices to say, let's connect all the odd numbered ports on HBAs and all odd numbered ports on storage arrays into an odd fabric, and then all the even ports on all sides on an even fabric. So here I have it depicted the same way. And consequently, we have a concept of a fan in, and that is number of hosts trying to send data to the storage array. It's a very similar subject, just a matter of where the data is flowing. The second thing about switched fabric is this concept of saying we have more than one switch in in the fabric, and those two switches need to talk to each other. Conceptually, and from what we probably we know from soft theory, is that we can connect these switches together, and we will connect them using an interest switch link. Commonly, all people within the industry refer to just an ISL, knowing what that acronym stands for, it is, I think, is a bit more of an educational thing than anything else useful. But you have an ISL connecting between two E type of ports within the fabric, and those ISLs will carry the data. We also have a concept of the domain ID to differentiate one switch from the other within the same connected system. And again, the concept of the domain ID is very simple. If every switch knows about worldwide names and other ports that are connected to it, we need to have a system to differentiate between port zero and switch one and port zero and switch two. There is a bit of a no best practices in domain IDs. We would like to point out here that if you are connecting to different switches, it, we do not advise you to connect them and have the same domain ID on both. Therefore, please don't make sh- check the domain IDs before the switches are connected. Make sure they're different, and then you'll be able to safely connect those two. What we would like to take this conversation, though, is into ISL over subscription. And the concept of our subscription is simple. It is simply about how much traffic is this one fiber channel line carrying from one point to the other. And if we look in this example and we say, imagine a system where we have 16 gig ports through and through. So if we look on the left, we got four 16 gig ports going to switch number four, a single 16 gig ISL line connecting to switch number three, and then two of them going to the array. This here is gonna give me an oversubscription of four to one. We got four ports on the left going into one port that's gonna connect an ISL. And the question with this comes in, what does good look like when we talk about our oversubscription? And for that, we need to kind of pause a little bit and think it in perspective. So here I have a continuum of all possible ISL oversubscription levels. Now, naturally, they can go higher than 10 to 1, but from 7 to 1 to 10 to 1 is where typical vendor documentation calls maximum recommendation. You can kind of look at that and you can say, hey, I picked up different documentation from different times. There's a bit of a variety between 7 to 1 and 10 to 1, but that's usually where it goes. Now, if you ask a professional and say, hey, you're seven to one, a good uh, oversubscription. A lot of them will kind of say, "Ah, A, depends, and B, it might sound a little too high. So what does this depend on is a good question. And we would like you to consider a workload as something this is going to depend on. So Brandon, I have several workloads in here, and they're defined in a certain way let's say a database, what can you say about the definitions and about the database workload? So if you look at, and I think this is a really interesting uh, point of the conversation, is, is you start looking at workloads and type of workloads that Fiber Channel is good for. Now you can segment out what type of workloads um, you need to you know, design your, your network differently, especially for oversubscription. Uh, so if you look at you know, you know, the two different types of database you know, workloads, which is database and warehouse, 
you know, you got standard databases, um, the block size. So this is the I.O. size to the actual, you know, when you're uh, querying storage and getting I.O.s back for standard oil to the database um, will be about 8K. Um, they'll get bigger for warehouses and big data. Uh, but the read-write itself um, I think is interesting because uh, you're really reading, you know, in terms of this type of workload 25% of the time and writing, you know, 75% of the time. Um, and so uh, that's important as well because, it, you know, it's the right performance and re-performance of a storage array um, could be different, and so it also impacts over subscription. So this type of database tends to be, you know, revenue generating, it can be ordering, something like that. Uh, so this type of database, usually you want to run lower. Um, but, Mark, you know, for the random and sequential stuff, from a storage point of view, um, how, do you, how does that also impact how you look at um, over subscription? Thank you. Uh, the random and sequential in this case is really the sensitivity on the response time. And if we think about it, the generically random I.O. takes is processed by storage arrays a little differently than sequential. Sequential I.O. fits into some sort of algorithms of optimization. Storage arrays can anticipate future reads and writes, and therefore they can preload some of the stuff into cache, and the response time could be better than if it's a random. So combined with read writes and combined with sensitivity to response time is the necessary logic that one should apply to think about what should be the ISL over subscription on the switches going from hosts to the storage array. So read write 75 writes, that means majority of my data is flowing to the storage array. If I look at the warehouse, my read writes are flipped so majority of my data is, is being read and it's flowing the other way. That's a second thing to kind of look at it and say, how is my data flowing? So if I look at the IoT, this is a new emerging workload. It's hardly a very defined workload like a database and warehouse, but we can at least talk about it. And here we have the block size, it's mixed, depending what that is. Could be a very, very large video frame. It could be very small if it's some sort of a temperature sensor. But most of it is going to be all right. IoT is producing these data that we then capture and collect at the central locations. And the sensitivity of response time is a little different. While in here, we can kind of sit down and think about it and say, perhaps we can sustain a higher ISL over subscription. That is the impact on my response time and the impact on the bandwidth. Is, is okay because I may have some bottleneck in the old subscription level. So, well, Mark, another question we urge, um, for you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. If I look at over subscription, you're saying, well, you know, max typical. Is it better just to design my network with lower over subscription to start with? You're going to have to explain that one a little bit more, Ben. So when I designed my network and you had the number of ISLs that we talked about, you know, number of, you know, uh, you know, going across the fabric and then you know, types of different types of directories and switches in the fabric, um, is it better instead of just you know, designing my system with an eight to one over subscription that I just target a four to one or three to one over subscription so it gives me room to grow? Ah, oh, that not makes sense. Thank you for asking that. And the answer is probably not because you're – Overall design is going to change as you're going to be adding more hosts and more switches in your environment. You can start designing with a certain number in mind, but the trick really is to keep an eye on it as you move forward. Also, if you're going to be placing different workloads in your environment, let's say you started with something insensitive like an IoT and later on adding something more sensitive like a database, well, then your design needs to change to reflect what is it that your network carrying from A to B. Thanks for that question. That was excellent. So when you find yourself that your ISL over subscription is a bit too high, what do you do? And the answer to that is kind of simple. You add more ISLs and you also trunk them. So in the earlier picture, we had a four to one. If I had a second ISL line and I trunk it together, I now drop it all the way to two to one. And now that's a much better number for me to carry my traffic from left to right and back and forth. 
also the the trunking capability in, in in the vendors i think to be safe all of them at this point is going to be to load balance the isl lines and load balance the buffers and credits so that the system is more intelligent about where to send the io to which brings us to other topologies so the most common scalable topology that you will see is so-called core edge topology where we have a number of hosts connecting to the edge level switches, which in turn are connecting to the core switches using a whole bunch of ISLs, and then the core switches are servicing storage arrays. And then the extension of that is an edge core edge topology, where we're adding yet another edge level switches that are connecting to the storage arrays, because in this example, we now have more storage arrays that we can actually physically connect to the core switches. And you will see in the large organizations, there's going to be some concepts either to the core edge infrastructure or edge core edge infrastructure whenever they keep growing into these amounts. So here's an example of a pretty large network where we build a couple of edges going to the core switches and connect them to a couple of core switches going to the edges. And it doesn't stop here. We can still guarantee the delivery. We can still guarantee the performance and double the scale because Fiber Channel is able to do that. So here's an example of adding two more designs in here to move forward. And here, the trick is to say, keep an eye on the ISLO subscription. You can build these scalable environments pretty easily. But remember about what workloads you're serving and what are you sending them. Now, pause and see if we have any questions. We have quite a few of them, actually, um, and trying to figure out which ones to go first. Uh, let's, let's kind of work our way backwards so that things that are, that are more fresh will be uh, approached. So regarding the fan-in ratio um, and, and, and what, um, the question came in that said, would you, the question is, would you still say 7 to 1 up to 10 to 1 is a typical vendor maximum recommendation with all flash arrays? In other words, what is the impact of having all flash arrays on the older subscription calculation? Very good question. Uh, remember, the flash arrays technology is about how the storage array, most of them have caching infrastructure, so it's about how fast they get data from the disk onto the cache level. Fan in and fan out is more from the cache level out. So from that point of view, no, there is no difference from fan in and fan out based on how, whether your storage or is flash or not flash, or we call it hybrid in the industry. Okay. Next question. And, yep, and speaking of fan-in ratios, because these things do tend to, to dovetail together, when you're, doing the, when you're doing the identification of what, the, uh, what, what you're counting, do you count the number of physical ports, or do you need to count the virtual connections as in NPIV? Hmm, that's a, that's a great question. So... I would take this uh, a little bit less less scientific and more touchy-feely, right? The whole idea of fan-in and fan-out <laughs> is not necessarily about physical ports. This is about data being sent from A to B. So how much data can we possibly stuff through a single pipe coming into the storage array or coming out? And in that case, NPIV is sort of a bit of an irrelevant level because we may be sending large block I.O. with big throughput that will be occupying most of my buffer credits, physical buffer credits, of connecting two boxes. And it's just a signal thing, and it will be draining that line. Or we can spread around multiple hosts and get to the same point. So don't think about it in terms of virtual or, or physical. Think about it of we have a lot of data that's being sent from A to B or B to A, and how do we pass that data through a natural bottleneck, which would be a single ISL line for a subscription or a single connection line from storage array to the switch, or sometimes it could be the whole site. Yeah, and I think that um, if, I can, if I can sort of summarize what you just said in, in a way, if you remember the graphics that you had before, the calculations were done based upon the link speeds. And those, that's how we actually measured what, what qualified as oversubscription. Whereas in, in this particular case, and Brendan's going to go on to this a little bit later on, NPIV is more of an addressing scheme. 
for these kinds of conversations. So we, we do addressing through NPIB uh, within the fabric as opposed to calculating speeds through NPIB. So uh, do you think I summarized that properly? Yes, that was great. Thank you, Jay. And I think in the interest okay. of time, so we need to move on. Agreed. Uh, there, are, there are additional questions, and should we have additional time at the end, we will get back to it because some of these are really good questions. So, Brandon, uh, I believe Brandon is, uh, is up next, right? You, you bet. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, great questions so far, great discussions, um, and thanks to everybody um, for all their hard work putting this presentation together. Um, what Mark has done a great job of doing is talking about how Fiber Channel works, talks about how the credit buffer system gives you guaranteed delivery and really guaranteed delivery at scale, and you can build very uh, large fabrics in terms of, you know, the size of the switches and drugs you put into it. Um, nice thing about Fiber Channel is it just naturally works. Um, you plug things in and it works um, in terms of connectivity, routing, name, service, and all that stuff. And so I'm going to talk more about the services that are behind the scenes and, and make this work and, and, and bring in benefits in terms of Fiber Channel. Um, you know, so just some quick definitions um, in terms of, some, you know, and I'm not going to list all fiber services, and I'm not going to talk specifically about, you know, standards or where they fit um, and division and stuff like that. I'm just going to talk about how easily these things work and the benefits they bring to your fiber channel network uh, to deliver really high availability, high performance storage access. Um, the first one is discovery services. Um, so, you know, uh, from a definitional point of view, you know, fiber channel provides a name service uh, that ports when you log in or connect a new port to the fabric and discover all the other ports they have access to. Um, and this is very useful in, in scanning storage, finding a, a storage um, target that, that you need to connect to, um, setting up new ones, seeing if they migrate. There's a whole list of things um, that you can do with that, but this is a core technology that provides a lot of benefits, and fiber channels are technologies that's integrated that into really the, the base of uh, fabric services. The other one is, you know, the second one is fabric, you know, how we do routing. And we do fabric shortest path first, um, and this is a routing protocol um, that calculates the best path between switches. Um, you know, it has some weighting. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to talk about really simple examples because the complex examples get very complex, so we can spend a full hour on that. Uh, but it, it establishes routes across the fabric. Uh, Mark's done a great job talking about the different types of uh, uh, fabrics and how big they can get and how complex they can get. Fiber channel, uh, FSPF has always been very good at providing reliable um, uh, routing across the fabric and in-order frame delivery. Um, and it also has a backup path in case there's an ISO that goes down or a switch that goes down so that all the, all the, um, all the uh, frames still get sent in order because uh, that's really important for high-performance storage network. And then zoning. I'll touch base on zoning. Um, and it's actually two slides, lots of words. But I'll touch base on it because zoning is a pretty big subject. And we actually have a complete um, uh, FCIA webcast just on zoning, um, different pieces of it, and how you can uh, work with zoning and manage it in your data center. So kind of give you some pictorial ideas. Um, and Mark has some great pictures that I was able to uh, add to. Um, the name discovery services in, you know, really in, in, enlarges a database that sits inside each of one of the fiber switches. Um, as each device logs in, a port name, and its location stored in a database in the fabric. And this database can be accessed by other ports logging in, limited by zoning, limited by other stuff, but it gives you an idea of who's all, in, you know, that you can have access and routes to in terms of the fan, uh, in terms of the fan. Um, the ports can query the fabric, uh, do discovery, uh, without having to go out and scan every port out there. Initiators in the scan, you know, this is great for initiators. When we see this in NVMe, um, you know, Fiber Channel provides a very nice name service for NVMe over Fiber Channel or NVMe over Fabrics, where, you know, the discovery is handled at the fabric itself, and customers can go in and use the fabric services, identify NVMe over Fiber Channel or NVMe or, over Fabrics targets, and they will scan them and, you know, pull down the information and know what um, resources that sit on that target or a storage device for them. Second one is um, the um, uh, SSPF protocol, um, and this is how the device sets up a new ISL and then communicates topology. So the first protocol that's part of this is the Hello protocol. It simply says, "Hey, how can we talk?" And this is, you know, the, you know, this is how I can talk. This is the things I can do, and it allows two devices to set 
you know, all the all the parameters up so they can actually establish communication because they're going to be transferring a database and other information between two switches um, in the fabric. And I said this is communication between two switches um, in terms of setting up ISLs. Um, they also calculate and, and communicate a topology database and synchronize that across the fabric. So once I add a new switch, um, the ISL comes up. I, I, I um, say, hey, I'm the switch. This is what I have. These are the resources. This is the domain ID. This is number four. And from that, the, um, the other switch says, okay, I'll add in my database. I know what port on my system you're sitting on. And then it communicates that topology database across the fabric. There's also a topology database maintenance protocol. Uh, and then this is when uh, ISO goes up, ISO goes down, um, you know, in terms of what's already been discovered. A uh, switch goes down. Um, and, and any kind of a change in the fabric, which can um, result in some form of RSCN. Um, and this communicates throughout the fabric, hey, something changed, this is the topology, and then all the new routes are set up. With FS, uh, PS path selection, um, I think I actually have it. Yeah. This is, I'm going to use a very simple example here. Um, Fiber Channel uses a least cost approach to determine what paths, um, and this is mainly weighted by ISL speed. There are sometimes some user um, configurable um, settings that you actually um, weigh some ISLs differently than others, uh, but since this works so well, um, we usually see customers just set this up, connect it, and leave it as is because we get really good communication performance across the fabric. Um, so if you have a you know a 32 gig ISL versus 16 IS, uh, gig ISL, you'll get more weighting towards the 32 gig. Um, and where I have um, the you know the past selected pointers there, it's a very easy diagram uh, because it's easy to see what the best path is there. But I could have multiple switches, and if you look at the large topology, I'll have multiple ISLs and multiple paths across the fabric. This will pick the best path, uh, path as well as an alternative path. Make sure that frames are delivered in order. Um, when I have ISLs and multiple ISLs between two different switches, um, I can use things for load balancing or trunk. Trunking to be able to um, make the ISLs look bigger or fatter. Um, and as I said, uh, the backup path is also selected. So this is a very nice protocol. Um, it's been in existence and pretty stable for almost 20 years, uh, maybe more than 20 years. Um, so and it's been proven in the data center proven in the largest data centers around the world uh, for a long, long time. So it's stable. Uh, it works really well. Um, as I said, it's simple to use, use simple to deploy. I do is connect things to the fabric, and these uh, fabric services set everything up automatically. The one that customers um, will spend time working on or managing is zoning. Zoning is basically creating smaller fabrics um, in terms of what you can, what you can see. Um, it allows you know, specific groups of devices to communicate with each other. Um, zones limit communication between devices that care about each other. So if I have, you know, two different, you know, very data center and I have two different customers in that data center, two different applications, I can separate those with zoning um, and provide isolation between um, the two sets of workloads. Um, and then, you know, in this scenario with the fiber channel, there's a fabric zone server that controls zoning. And when you set it up, um, you can figure uh, what devices can see what. And so I have some examples here in the diagram. So on the left, I have a red zone, um, and then, you know, I have a green zone and a purple zone. Those are each different servers that are zoned one-to-one -to, -one to a storage system. And if you assume a single port or you know, on, a, on a single fabric, two ports or two fabrics, and you set up the zoning like that, what, you, what the server does is it comes up, it, it accesses the main server. It sees only that one target device. It goes and scans that target device, and then usually um, you give it access to the device that it owns and go in and do whatever it wants on the device. Um, you can zone multiple uh, servers to the same storage array. You can uh, zone a single server to multiple storage arrays, um, and there's lots of best practices on how to do this, um, usually um, some kind of balance of these two. Now, if we look at zoning overall, um, there's a, if you look at the bottom, there's a link. Uh, there's a very nice uh, webinar, a uh, full webinar, and a bunch of slides that go through and talk about all the intricacies of zoning. Um, and here's some basic 
uh, terminology I pulled from that, that uh, great presentation I put on uh, sponsored by the FCIA. Uh, but you got things called a zone set, which is just a collection of zones, active zone set, uh, a zone that's set enforced by the fabric, a zone or container with members representing end devices. A member is, you know, if, if, a, if a zone set is a member in a zone, in a zone a member represents the end device or group devices. And then you have aliases, you have default zones that contain devices not a member of any zone. You have basic zoning in mode um, that, you know, zoning changes do not require a fabric-wide block. Enhanced zoning is I actually add a fabric-wide block um, and then, you know, when it's obtained, I change things and then everything gets committed and then it gets changed across the fabric. Um, depending on the infrastructure, depending on the size of your fabric, and depending on the workloads, um, you may want to choose different types, different features or different pieces of zoning to implement a data center. Uh, with that, um, I talk about performance. Any questions? There are, but so far I think we can probably split them to the end and kind of collect them all together at the same time. Sounds good. Now, I think including um, with Fiber Channel is we designed Fiber Channel, and has been designed um, for very busy workloads and busy data centers. And I want to be able to utilize this resource as much as I can and get as much performance and IOs or IOPS out of my storage systems as possible to really support things like you know, how many transactions can I run from my data center? How many, how much revenue can I generate? How many new, um, you know, uh, web pages can I serve up? All those types of things run well on Fiber Channel. And what you want to do is when I get busy and I see different types of traffic and I see really, you know, that I see very little impact to my system performance. So here's a nice little, uh, you know, uh, um, example we did um, in terms of um, from Broadcom. And basically, if you take your fiber channel fabric, and I just show one of the two fabrics here um, to make a simple discussion, um, and you start in injecting traffic, and you really start, you know, loading up the system with different types of traffic going to different devices, I see just a moderate decrease in performance on my original workload. So on the, on the graph on the right, but that is the workload. Um, I still have 100% uh, of, you know, the workload. They can be 8 gig, 16, 32 gig, or somewhere in, dep in, in between, depending on the performance it needs. And then as I increase the traffic, due to the buffer credits, due to the routing, due to zoning, due to all of these different features we talked about, um, I only see, as I said, up to, what, about 30, 35% degradation in performance. And this is very good for networking. I mean, you can show and other types of situations that you can, you know, uh, without the credit systems, without these features and technology features that we that we have in Fiber Channel, um, you don't get that kind of performance curve in terms of overloading the fabric. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Jay, um, and, and thank you for your time. Yeah, it, the, it, this is this has been really good. Um, when we started talking about you know the idea of scalability and why fiber channel um, is is a is a key technology for being able to for being able to do this in storage. We often sort of basically said that you know well fiber channel will scale to you know tens of thousands of nodes and and other other forms have have natural limitations. What we were trying to do today was to talk about look we've got the name service which understands how the entire network. Is, is organized from the, from the center from the center outward, um, and we manage each link on a credit based system. So everything from the smallest link all the way to the largest um, uh, physical entity of, of, a, of a domain or, or a fabric is is well understood and well known. But without being able to to, to have a webinar like this one, we were kind of left to think, well, you know, fiber channel scales, but this is how it actually gets done. So it's been kind of an important thing. To that end, there are still some questions that have come through that I think we can probably spend a little bit of time trying to help clarify. And I want to I want to go all the way back to the conversation about the fan-in ratio because it's where we've gotten so, quite a bit of, of questions. So I'm going to ask the question, and I and I'm going to give it to you, Mark, because this was part of your section. But I think that we we need to kind of reinforce the idea of of how the calculations work, namely. The question comes in is, is there a typical vendor maximum recommendation for fan and ratios at 16 gig or 32 gig? 
And if you could, if you could help touch back on that one, I think that we could probably start use that as a starting point. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. We may. I'm not sure if we can control the slides and go back to the slide where we show different recommendations. But yep, use the, the um, see if, if you can try that. Let me just answer the question. It's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll do it mentally. And the fanning ratio is counted by number of ports connected at the end of the day. So the fan in and fan out uh, in, in terms of 16 gig, 32 gig it is – is a little less of a problem, although it does make sense from the point of view of the bandwidth. But it is it is a metric to maintain the safety of your entire, not the safety, the, the, the stability of the fiber channel that we're trying to get to. So if you have storage arrays sitting on a 32 gig and then and a host at 16 gig, you can still connect and, and have a fan-in ratio where you will utilize and equate your gigabits per second. So in this case, 32 gig line of the storage array will be good as two 16 gig connections to kind of get through to what you're trying to do. Um, it's also the, the speed of the line is also being used for ISL over subscription. And we also use these metrics to make sure that we establish general idea of how data is being passed. And I want to stress this whole point out. We can talk about the definitions of these and maybe differences when we mix things up. But the biggest thing you guys got to always keep in mind is what is it being used for? How is my data being passed from the beginning till the end? If it's a read, how is the read going from the storage array to the host? If it's a write, how is the write going from the host to the storage array? And all of these metrics are there to pinpoint potential bottlenecks, which you will then be able to resolve. Now, leave it at that generic way of answering, Jay. Yeah, I'm glad that you didn't wait for me to finish this talk because I just found it. <laughs> so uh, this is, this is the magic of, of build slides having having to uh, to find it. Um, okay, so. So to that end, we do have a question about the oversubscription on the ISL, which actually segues nicely from your last question. I confess I'm not entirely sure about this, uh, so maybe you guys do. The question is, is there any difference between ISL oversubscription between a quote-unquote normal ISL or a FCR ISL? I'm not really sure what they mean by FCR, to be honest. I, I Googled it, and it's a brocade term called fiber channel routing. Uh, yeah, basically okay. it's data center to data center connectivity, right? And so this is, you know, ISLs inside the fabric, it's kind of easy because if you need more ISLs, you just connect them. But once you're going data center to data center, usually you're limited by what's in the ground, you know, what kind of optics, what kind of setup you have. And this is, you know, basically FCI, FCIP routing um, between two different SANs. Um, and so, yeah, the recommendations will be different, and you really need to, you know, Dig into what your workloads are, what your what your data movement needs is, and architect those links based on you know the bandwidth that you require and the bandwidth available. Yeah, and once you once you start getting into external data center inter, uh, connectivity, then you then you wind up with some other uh, other considerations as well. And and FCIA has done a a few technical presentations on distance, including FCIP and and um, and other distance forms as well. So I do recommend that if you are interested in extensions beyond the data center for Fiber Channel, to take a look at fiberchannel.org uh, for the webinars uh, from about a year ago. We've, we've, and they're still salient. They're still relevant to take a look at some of the, the long-distance Fiber Channel webinars that we've done, particularly for that particular that type of re, uh, question. Um, moving on, we do have a couple of other uh, questions, as a matter of fact. Um, so um, I am going to I'm going to I'm going to save the interfabric routing questions uh, for probably another time, mostly because of the fact that uh, I think we we may move beyond the, the scope of a scalability question. Um, I know it's I know it's related and the Venn diagrams do uh, do overlap, but that's not one that we've actually had a lot of preparation for. So I think we probably may want to include a new 
uh, a possibility of a new webinar on, on inter, interfabric routing. Um, to that end, uh, looks like we did, did I do this? Did we talk? I mean, uh, nothing is starting to blend for me. Did we already talk about uh, setting buffer credits in the switches and performance issues, or did I accidentally mark that? No, we, we we didn't no, talk, we about, talked it. about that. Uh, no, I would actually opt to take that that one in the blog form. Okay, yeah, because it's a little bit it's a little bit um, uh, involved. Okay, so. And it used to be that Bright Talk would allow you to go directly to the slides you needed to go, and unfortunately, it doesn't do that any longer. Yeah, that, I tried <laughs> that button as well, and it didn't do anything for me, so I, I understand why we're clipping <laughs> back and forth. Yeah, so my apologies for going all the way through uh, the deck, both backwards and forwards. Um, we do have uh, we have posted inside of the Bright Talk interface um, under attachments and links, this particular presentation's PDF, you can download it right now, or you can also go into the fiberchannel.org website where you'll be able to download it there. It'll probably be a little bit faster and easier to do it from here at the moment. Um, as we noted that there are a, a lot of other great resources that, that, that overlap a bit about this to help create a broader uh, story. Uh, including the zoning conversation, the, uh, the the PDF has a bigger link in the in the graphic um, that we can actually that you can actually use to go uh, to directly to that particular webinar. Um, and as I'm talking, I see more questions coming in, which we'll get to in a second. Um, before we do, there's, there's a lot of great resources that we have on performance with Fiber Channel and what could possibly affect. Fiber channel, everything from the congestion to the in-cast, and, and there's a number of different things about how do the different technology, storage networking technologies, actually uh, address natural problems in large-scale fabrics. And Fiber Channel does it one way, Ethernet does it another way, and these are some of the places where you can go to find out some uh, some more information about how to handle those types of, of sizes and scales. So having said that, we do have a little bit of time left. I'm going to go ahead and take a quick look at the questions that just came in. Um, there's actually a really good question. I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and give this to you, Mark, for, for the time being. And, Brandon, of course, you can chime in. Is it recommended to change buffer credits based on the type of traffic that's being run? For instance, we talked about the workloads earlier. Do we need to worry about buffer credits and modifying those depending upon the workload? Thank you for the question. Uh, and my short answer is no. The whole balance of the system lays in the fact that the entire the entire line knows about which buffers it has. The whole point of view of credits is just knowing how many buffers does my neighbor have. So changing those inherently changes the ability to send data back and forth. So you may see some people allude to that as a way to avoid or, or control congestion. But the congestion management is, frankly, outside of our conversation here. It's a bit of a sideways topic. We have a good session on that. In fact, it's on the screen right now, and I'll leave it at that. So generically speaking, my advice is don't play around with those, with those credits. Let the system be able to handle it on its own. Fair enough. So to that end, and I think this actually segues to, from that answer, if you let the system handle it on its own, how, how do we plan or account for the varying port speeds among the hosts and arrays in a, fair, in a fabric, you know, especially with respect to those buffer credits? And is that question for Mark or for Brandon? Either one. So I'll Go take a stab, it. and Brandon, you take a stab, and then we'll see if we agree. And um, my answer would be first, and I'll, again, go to the route of simplification. And the simplification would be the fact that we want to be synchronized and balanced and, and sort of use the gigabit speed of your connectivity as a centralizing point of understanding what's happening there. Now, generically speaking, your 16 gigabit interface is going to have less buffer credits and less buffers than a 32 gigabit interface. And we use the gigabit connectivity speed to establish common language when we're trying to identify 
what's going to happen, what's the oversubscription is going to be, and at the end of the day, how the fan in and fan out is going to work. And I'll leave it at that. Now, that's not entirely always true. You can look and look at those counters and say different vendors and switches and hubs and the HBAs may have some differences. But you need to start somewhere, and the speed is the simplest one to, hit, to, to kind of lock in on that. And then the second big thing, is a consideration of the workload. What's happening? What kind of data am I pushing through? Use two of those and you'll be able to design your systems better. Go ahead, Brendan. Yeah, so something that's important is us as vendors is we build these systems. You know, we take into account what the buffer credit should be, you know, based on length, uh, length of the cables and and architectures and how the fire is built and, and all those nice little things. So we do the work for you. So probably 99% of the ports you have out there, just going with the standard um, credits um, that are assigned when you connect the fabric up, will work fine. Um, there might be some cl uh, corner cases that, that, we can talk, that we can talk about in a different session, maybe even around congestion, that it might be a different discussion. Uh, but overall, this, you know, this fiber channel is a plug and play network. Um, and while a lot of analysis can be done, you know, once you figure out your fan-in ratio, you plug your ports in, you make sure you have redundant fabrics, after that you just consent and let it go. And so I would say, you know, don't worry about um, changing all those types of settings um, unless you have a, a specific reason to on a specific workload. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and jump in here because of the timing uh, of, of, of where we're getting on the clock. But um, I would like to refer people to the, the sessions here, especially the Fiber Channel Performance uh, webinar, which goes into this very question in, in a lot more detail, much more than we have the chance to do it here. Um, all of the stuff that, that was asked and talked about is gone to great depth and detail for, in that Fiber Channel Performance session. So I highly recommend for those people who are asking the questions about the, the the credit systems and those kinds of things to go ahead and take a look at that particular uh, session for some of those answers in in glorious detail. Um, on that note, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so I am have the unenviable task of closing us out and uh, bidding you all adieu. I would like to let you know that we are going to be doing our next webcast on fiber channel SAN workload. So. All the stuff that we talked about earlier about being able to understand the workload and its impact uh, on the network and why fiber channel or how fiber channel um, you know manages these is going to be uh, wrapped into the next session. So you can honestly you can actually see how we are trying to uh, progress the story from one to the other, and, and you can use this as kind of a, a series. So uh, we will be announcing on FCIA News on Twitter as of the date and time. So keep an eye on your favorite Twitter stream to find out what it is that, uh, when it is that we're going to be doing this. It just hasn't been scheduled currently. If you have additional questions and you want to have them answered in the Q&A blog, by all means, get them in right now. That's uh, going to be um, uh, our next job is to answer your questions in glorious detail. Make sure that you check us out for all the different things that we've done before, all the different kinds of stuff. There's a lot of information that we've provided in the past and what we're going to be doing in the future for you to understand how Fiber Channel works. I would like to make a, a secondary request that you please, please, please provide feedback. Um, we, we really listen to what you say. We, we pay attention to the comments. We are striving to, keep, to be as useful as possible for people who want to find out more information. If it was too high or too low, or you want to find, or if it's just right, if, if we happen to manage the Goldilocks education here, that's fantastic too. Just by all means, please uh, don't forget to leave feedback and, and a rating for this particular webinar. So having said that, I want to thank all of you for attending. I want to thank our, our, uh, our speakers for taking time out of their days to put together this gorgeous presentation. It's one of the, the prettiest graphics I've seen in a while. I think we have Mark to thank for a lot of that. Um, so thank you, Mark. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, and thank you to the audience for attending, a, attending the session today. So cheers. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you.